follow you up to the to the lesson nine and I can get to number 10 is never so close to you before. So amazing. Thank ah, you. <laughs> okay. Yes, I saw you on the leaderboard, uh, Sarada. You were 10th in the Paddy competition. That's yeah. very cool. Um, so to catch people up, the most recent news on the Paddy competition is I did uh, two more entries. And I don't remember, I think I might have shown you, I can't remember if I showed you one or both. But uh, yeah, so I ensembled the um, bottles that we had, and that improved the submission from 9876 to 988. And then the other thing I did was I, you know, since the VIT models are actually definitely better than the rest, I kind of doubled their weights. And that got it from 9881 to 9884. And let's see, Serada. Serada, you're down to 11th. You're going to have to put in another oh. effort to uh, <laughs> yeah, get back in the top the... 10, my friend. Yep. Anybody else here on this uh, leaderboard somewhere? Yeah, I'm down at, uh, I don't know, was it 37 last time I checked? 37, that's not bad. What's your username? I think I'm it's- guessing this is not you. Matt. <laughs> it's Matt. Matt. Oh. Uh, yeah, Matt. Ah, Matt Rosinski, 45. Oh yeah, slip taking further. Yeah, you just, you can't stop for a moment with these things or somebody will jump in ahead. I, I tried that. Yeah, sixties is pretty good. I, I've had problems with paper space, so I couldn't train again. Oh no! I don't know if people have been successful. Like still, just not being able to log in. Just error. I know. I I subscribe to the paid version still. I'm not sure. Maybe they're restructuring something. An error. No. Oh. Well, feel free to share it on the forum if it's an error that we might be able to help you with. I think it's just a generic when you try to set up a machine and just says error. Was oh, paper space error, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, that's annoying. They're quite, uh, they're quite receptive if you use their support in the email. Um, I know I had an issue and they got right back to me. The problem you know, another thing is if the error is your fault, i.e. if you put something in pre-run.sh that breaks things, then um, just fire up a PyTorch instance rather than a fast AI instance, because that doesn't run pre-run.sh. And so then you can fix it. I'll give it a try, thank you. Um, and, but I have to say thank you for Reddit to set up the the competition to help us to get started. What did Radek do? Uh, he also shared uh, in the forum um, to set up the, the local for us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's yes. very thank, thank you for him to get me back on the <laughs> Kaiko. Yes. Awesome. So now Radek's next job will be to become a Kaggle Notebooks Grandmaster. That's what I'm going to be watching out for. I think he's got what it takes, personally. Nice, you've had, a, you've had a gold, sure. right? Radek, a gold medal? You've had a gold on Kaggle for Notebooks? Notebooks not. Uh, I'm not sure what I have for Notebooks. Just uh, I haven't done that many notebooks ever. I think I have- uh, What's your username on Kaggle? Let's find you. Radek1. Radek1 uh, one with a uh, number, not uh, not uh, written, not, not word. Yeah, that's me. That's me, that's me. Two silvers, yeah. okay. So this one actually is on the way to being a gold. It just, it's got so close. You need 50 votes from um, regulars. I guess, I don't know what counts as a regular. 
Well, that's how it works. So it's not in the relative terms. The, the no, it's just 50 votes full stop. So, oh, um, and you know, I, I definitely noticed like, it makes a big difference to, yeah, so therefore it makes a big difference to um, put notebooks in popular competitions because that's where people are looking. So like this one got 400 votes, right? And I'm not sure it's necessarily my best notebook, but it was part of the patent competition, which um, had a lot of people working on it. So that's one trick. The Yeah, so things which are not actually attached to any competition, it's much harder to get votes for. Yeah, I'm getting pretty close to Notebooks Grandmaster, actually. So Ooh, pretty excited you about up. that. What's your, something to do with loving science, I'm guessing. What's yours? It's gonna... actually, well, yeah, my, the, the, the link is slightly different, actually. It's okay. T-A-N. T-A-M or L N. N. L I K E S yep. M A T H. Oh, math, not science. Okay. <laughs> Let's take a look. Oh, look at you, 74. Very nice. Mm -hmm. And you need two more golds. Now, these nine silvers. Ah, oh, well, that's. I'm going to go upload this stuff right now. Let's see. Huh? I'm going to go upload all this Oh, stuff. there we go. Yeah, that's. <laughs> that's um... <laughs> Do it. Channel our enthusiasm to getting Tanish Kinton Notebooks Grandmaster. That would be cool. Yeah, so just have to uh, get those silver ones over the line, huh? All right, so um, I've. Um, Uh, somebody asked about where the um, uh, the gist uploading thing is. So let me dig that up. Um, oh, and actually, when I do, what I might do here is I'm going to uh, I'm going to connect to my server. Someone asked about the with the gist uploading. Is that a question asked in the forum somewhere? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. On the forum, exactly. Um, and we'll see when I connect to this computer. It's busy doing stuff. Um, and specifically, this is what it looks like when you're busy training a model. Um, using weights and biases. So you can see I've got three windows here. How do you get rid of the dots? I always oh, don't know. That just means that I've got another Tmux session running on a different computer, which has a smaller screen than this one. Um, and there is where some way to get rid of it by disconnecting other sessions, disconnect other clients. Prefix D gives you connected clients. Whichever you select is disconnected. Let's try that. No, that's not right. Oh, they probably mean Shift D. There we go. All right, so this is the one I just created. So if I hit this, there we go. So Shift D and then select the one to disconnect. Oh, nice. Okay, learn something new. Um, oh, we've got another new face today. Hello, Sophie. I don't think you've joined us before. Is that right? Um, I've been here just quietly in the background sometimes. Uh, okay. Thank you for joining. Whereabouts are you visiting us from? Uh, in Brisbane. Oh, good on you. Um, mm. And what, um, uh, do you work with AI stuff or you're just getting no. started? <laughs> Not at all. Um, background in psychology. I'm doing a postdoc in psych and sort of, yeah, trying to move over into data science. Okay, cool. Have you done a lot of the statistical side of psychology? Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. And quite a bit of coding in R, but I'm pretty mm -hmm. new to Python. So okay, it's great. a big, big learning curve. Well, you know what, you're, you're our target market, right? So if you have any <laughs> questions along the way, please jump in. Even things that you feel like everybody else must know, 
uh, I guarantee not everybody else knows yeah. them. So um, yeah, definitely. These have been really helpful and really great awesome. for the running. Awesome. Thanks for joining. Um, okay. So you're training yeah. three models in parallel right now. Yeah. So I've got three GPUs in this machine. Um, and so, yeah, one nice thing with, with weights and biases is you basically, uh, let me show you. Okay, so here's weights and biases. And see, I don't use my Mac very much because nothing's locked in. All right. And so you can see it's running this thing called a sweep, right? Mm -hmm. So there's going to be 477 runs. I don't know why it says created 31 seconds ago, because that's certainly not true. But it's currently running. Um, and so it's coming from this Git repo. Um, I feel like there's a there's a like a sweep view because this is a particular run. This is this is a oh this is a particular run. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I'm, ter I'm terrible with the GUI um, to be honest. Okay, so let's go to the project. Yes, and then a there project we go. In the has room. and then a project has sweeps, and then um, okay, this one here I can kill because out okay so basically you kind of say on the on the linux side wnb you know sweep create or something like that and then um interesting it's all grouped under this thing oh okay yeah. all right so then yeah so then basically it runs um lots of copies of your program feeding at different configurations um and if, yeah, you can run the client as many times as you like. So I've run it three times. Uh, and each time I've set it to a different CUDA device. Uh, did, you, uh, did you turn your models into Python scripts and to able to do this or what yes, did you do? Yes, exactly. So, um, yeah. so this is fine-tune.py. So it's just calling, so it causes parse args. So that's going to just go through and check what batch size, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you asked for, right? Mm. Sticks them all into this parser thing, and then it calls train, passing in those arguments. And so then train is going to initialize weights and biases for this particular project, um, for this particular entity, which is fast AI, using the configuration that you requested. Um, and so then you can say, for example, okay, it's got some particular data set, some particular batch size, some particular image size, et cetera. And then it creates a learner for some particular model name, some particular pooling type, um, fine tunes it. And then at the end, it logs how much GPU memory it used, what model it was, how long it took. And um, you don't have to log much because the fast AI um, Weights and biases integration automatically tracks everything in the learner. So you can see here, there's all this like learner.architecture, learner.loss function, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Out of so curiosity, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. was this process of refactoring into a script painful? Or um, have you so did actually, you um, so actually, you can probably actually tell I didn't do this. Tom, uh, Thomas Capel did this. If I had done it, um, I would have used um, fast uh, fast core dot script instead of this stuff, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But uh, no, it wouldn't have been painful. I would have just uh, chucked an MB dev export on the cell that I had in my notebook, and that would have become, yeah, my script. So um, wouldn't be hi, Jeremy. Really painful. Hi. Uh, I have a question. Wouldn't wouldn't it be interesting to track? Uh, power consumption, for example? Um, I mean, for some people it might be, not for me. Um, <clears throat> as to how you would track power consumption, I have no idea. You'd have to have some kind of um, 
sensor connected to your power supply, I guess. They track a lot of system metrics in the runs. So like uh, if you look on a run, they will track like GPU memory, CPU memory. Yeah. Uh, stuff. Um, like, yeah, if you click on the, the thing on the left, um, it looks like a CPU chip, that thing. Yeah, there's a lot of, so maybe there's power in here. I don't, I don't see how it can be, right? Cause like it, well, unless the, the NVIDIA- GPU power tells usage? You that. Yeah, there's that? It, it does, here you go. GPU power, so NVIDIA tells you the GPU power usage apparently. Um, although that won't tell you about your CPU, et cetera, power. The thing that's useful about this is I think is the memory, uh, the graph. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the key thing is the maximum memory use. So we actually um, track that here um, in the script. Yeah, we put it into GPU mem. Oh, get GPU mem, okay. That's a fast AI thing? Get GPU mem is oh, okay. here, .cougar, nice. blah, blah, blah. So uh, Thomas did that as well. I don't know why it's <laughs> to the power of negative three. <laughs> What's what on earth is that about? Interesting. Curious. I will have no. to ask him what that's that's doing. Thomas that's works at weights and biases, right? Is that correct, right? Correct, correct, correct. Okay. Yeah. So he uh I had never used it before. So um um, yeah, so I, probably most people have never heard of this, but FastAI actually has a thing called FastGPU, which um, is what I've previously used for doing this kind of thing. So in general, when you've got more than one GPU, or just even if you've got only one GPU and you've got a bunch of things you want to run, it's helpful to have some way to say like, okay, here's the things to run, and then set a script off to go and run them all and track the results. So fast GPU was the thing I built to do that. Um, and the way fast GPU works is that you have a whole list of a whole uh, directory of scripts in a folder and it runs each script run at a time and puts them in, and it runs them, it puts them into a separate directory, you know, to say this is completed and it tracks the results and you can do it on like as many or few GPUs as you like and it'll just go ahead and run it. And this is fine, but it's very basic. Um, and I kind of been planning to make it a bit more sophisticated. And yeah, weights and biases takes it a lot further, you know, by, and I kind of want to re redo or add a, something on top of fast GPU. So it is fairly compatible with weights and biases, but you could do everything locally. So the key thing, um, so, the thing it's actually using to for that config file is it goes through the basically the Cartesian product of all the values in this YAML. So it's going to do each of these two data sets, planets and pets, uh, for this one learning rate, 0.08, for every one of these models, for every one of these poolings, um, for, okay, this is just the one resize method, and for every one of these experiment numbers. Um, so, yeah, um, so that's a little looks, project I'd uh, like to do at some point. The uh, the sweep allows you to run arbitrary programs. It doesn't have to be a script. So potentially you could just stay in the notebook and use tiny kernel or, or uh, sorry, like NB client thing or whatever it's called. Yeah, right exec NB, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it'd be fun to work on this to make the whole thing, you know, run with notebooks and um, stick stuff in a local SQLite database. And because like all this stuff, um, all this web GUI stuff, honestly, I don't like it at all. But the nice thing is it actually doesn't matter because I don't have to use it because they provide a, an API. So before I realized they have a nice API, I kept on like sending Thomas these messages saying, how do I do this? How do I do that? Why isn't this working? And you'd have to like send me these like pages of screenshots of like click here, click there, turn this off. Then you have to redo this three times. And it's like, oh, I hate this. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I found that then he was like, we do have an API. And I was like, I looked at the API. It is so well documented. It's got examples. Um, yeah, it's, it's really nice. Um, so I've put 
uh, all the stuff I'm working on into this Git repo. And so here's a tip, by the way, the, the information about if you're in a Git repo, the, or in a Git directory, to cloned directory, the information about your Git repo all lives in a file called .git slash config. Um, so you can see here, this is the Git repo. Um, so if we now go to GitHub, and One cool thing about this uh, runs is it tracks your git commit, like the run you can get back to what code version. Yeah, that is very cool, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think we could pretty easily create a a local only version of this without all the fancy GUI, you know, um, which would also have benefits. And then people who want the fancy GUI and run stuff from multiple sites, stuff like that would use weights and biases, but, you know, you could also do stuff without weights and biases. Anyway, here's our, um, yeah, so here's our uh, repo. And this analysis.ipynb is the thing that I showed yesterday, if you want to check it out. Um, and I'll put that in the chat. Paste. There you go. Oh, by the way, you know, I think something else which would be good is we should start, um, keeping a really good list for every walkthrough of like all the like key resources, key like, you know, links, key commands, examples we wrote and stuff like that. Um, so I think to do that, what we should do is we should um, turn all of the walkthrough top topics into wikis. I don't know if you folks have used wiki topics before, but basically a wiki topic simply means that everybody will end up with an edit button. Um, so if I just click, okay, this one already is a wiki, right? So everybody should find on walkthrough one that you can click edit, right? And so um, one thing we'd put in an edit, for example, would be probably like often Daniel has these really nice full walkthrough listings. We should have like a link to his reply which you can get, by the way, by, I think you click on this little date here. Yes, and that gives you a link directly to the post, which is handy. Um, what about this one? Okay, make that a wiki. Sorry, this is gonna be a little bit boring for you guys to watch, but I might as well do it while I'm here. And if anybody else has any questions or comments while I do that, yeah, um, Jeremy, mm -hmm. if that the fast GPU is possible to extend to high performance computing to um, use it on the note. Sorry, to, to, to do what? Uh, apply in high performance computing, so uh, in the distributed environment. Is it possible to track it as well? I mean, I don't, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, anything that's running on in in Python on a Linux computer should be fine. Um, I think some HPC things are like use their own weird job scheduling systems and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as long as it's running a you know normal NVIDIA, it doesn't even have to be NVIDIA, honestly. Um, but yeah, as long as it's running a normal Linux environment, it should be fine. It's it's pretty generic, you know, it's pretty general. Okay, so they are now all uh, wikis. And so something I did the other day, for example, was in walkthrough four, I added something saying like, oh, this is the one where we actually had a bug and you need to add CD at the end, you know, and I tried to create a little list of what was covered. And so for example, maybe, um, um, Matt's fantastic uh, timestamps we could copy and paste as um, list items into here, for instance. Uh, some of Radic's examples, maybe, or even just a link to it. Um, yeah, so for this walkthrough, we should certainly include this link to the analysis.ipynb. Anyway, so you can see, um, yeah, with the API, it was just so easy just to go api.sweep.runs and 
comes in as a dictionary, which we can then chuck a list of dictionaries into a data frame. Uh, okay, I'm rerunning the whole lot, by the way, because <clears throat> it turns out I um, made a mistake at some point. I, I thought that Thomas had told me that um, squish was always better than crop for resizing, and he told me I was exactly wrong. And it's actually that crop's always better than squish for resizing. So <laughs> I'm rerunning the whole lot, um, which is annoying, but shouldn't take too long. Um, do you find that analyzing the sweep results like this was mm, useful in uh, relative to like what you can see in the the UI? You know, you, oh, you God, can make it was so much better, Hamel. Yes, oh, so much. I was like, I mean, they've done a good job with that um, with that UI. Like, it's very sophisticated and clever and stuff. But I just never got to be friends with it. And as soon as I turned it into a data frame, it was just like, okay, now I can get exactly what I want straight away. It was absolute breath of fresh air, frankly. I really like their parallel coordinates chart. And I find it very difficult to reproduce that in like any visualization library. Do you? Like in a okay. way. I, I don't like the parallel coordinates chart, but um, yeah, I mean, there must be parallel coordinates chart for Python, aren't there? No, oh, there is. There's like a plotly one, but it's not that nice. Okay, because I don't like parallel to, coordinates, uh, I don't bother with it. So, to like hover over it and stuff and see, you know, so what, what is. Did they did they write their own? I think so. Yeah, oh, that's impressive. And they kind of wrote their own data frame kind of language, their own visualization library, in like in a sense, because yeah. like those weights and biases reports, you know, they have their own syntax. All right. Um, there isn't one in Plotly or something? Uh, yeah, there's one in Plotly for sure. Plotly things are normally interactive. So have you tried that yeah. one? Do you know if it's... Yeah, it works. Um, it's just, it's not as nice, but yeah, it works. Like when you hover over, like there's a, there is at least a version. This one doesn't. Yeah, Which that one weird. is like, it's very fiddly. You might have to draw a box around it yeah. to, to, uh, to highlight it. Oh, there you, yeah, go. there you go. Okay, so you just drag over it. Oh, that's not terrible. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. It's not the best UI, but, you know. Oh, okay, this is, thanks for telling me about this. It's cool. Um, but you don't think you don't you don't like this that much? It's not that useful for you. I mean, for, of... I haven't managed to. I mean, I know other people like it, so I'm, I don't doubt that it's useful for something. It's just apparently not useful for the things I've tried to use it for yet. Somehow, um, cool. How, I mean, how do you do? You kind of like drag over the the end bit to see where they come from or something? Or... Yeah. No. I mean, it might be useful if you want to look at the weights and biases one, because um, I think it renders one by default for you for the runs. Yeah. I believe. Yeah, it does. Um, and it's easier to like. Okay, let's check it out. Operate that, yeah. W and B slash. All right. Um, I think it could be in the sweeps thing. Most likely. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, pick a sweep. That one has zero runs, but I think maybe that one. Okay. And then, yeah. Okay. So here we go. Here we go. Like, um, and then when you just hover over a section, see, I like, mean, I it, don't see how this is helping me. <laughs> Well, if I guess like me saying so. <laughs> no, no. I mean, so there's not that much variance in the. Well, I guess like what is the metric we're trying to optimize? It doesn't really seem like it's even on this chart. Like, you know what I mean? Oh, like you know where... what? You probably have to tell it what your metric is, and we probably didn't. So the far right hand thing is resize method rather than yeah. Metric. So that's um, 
Is there some way to tell it that the, we care about error? I think I look, yeah, there's an edit. There's like a little pencil. Let's edit see. Panel. Okay. Add the column All for. Right, so if we add. Um, uh, like loss or something. I yeah, don't know. Let's do error. Uh, wait, this is. No, let's do accuracy and multi. Okay. Okay, now we're talking. All right. <laughs> you probably want to get rid of pool and resize method since they don't have any variants. Uh -huh. and they're not yeah. adding any information. Fair comment. All right. There we go. Now you can like cover over. No, the, I actually the... want to do the thing. Oh, here we go. Can I do this? Drag. There we are. Yeah, that doesn't. I mean, this is definitely not going to tell me more than. The number of experiments is not helpful either. No, that's true, because they're, um, there's just some arbitrary thing. Anyway, there's a thing. Um, yeah, I'm a, yeah. Sometimes I learn something, sometimes I don't from that visualization, you know? Mm -hmm. It's uh, not always. Okay, so um, it's control P D to detach. Um, do you generally like to do the the grid search thing or the Bayesian exploration? I uh, uh, so like I'm all very new to all this, right? So, but like in general, I don't do hyperparameter Bayesian hyperparameter stuff ever. Um, and that's kind of funny because I was actually the one that taught weights and biases about the method they use for hyperparameter optimization, um, uh, which actually tells you this is not quite true. I've used it once and uh, I used it specifically for finding a good set of dropouts for AWD LSTM because there's like five of them. And I told Lucas about how I had like created a random forest that actually tries to you know predict how accurate something's going to be, and then use that random forest to actually target better sets of hyperparameters. Um, and then, yeah, that's what they ended up using for weights and biases, which is really cool. Um, but I kind of like to really use a much more human-driven approach where I'm like, well, what's the hypothesis I'm trying to test? How can I test that as fast as possible? Like most hyperparameters are independent of most other hyperparameters. So, you know, like you don't have to do a huge grid search, whatever, and you can figure out. So for example, in this case, it's like, okay, well, the learning rate of 0.008 was basically always the best. So let's not try every learning rate for every model, for every resize type, et cetera. That, that's, let's just use that learning rate. Same thing for resize method, you know, crop was always better for the few things we tried it on. So I don't have to try every combination. Um, and also like, I feel like I learn a lot more about deep learning when I, you know, ask like, well, what do I want to know about this thing? Well, is that thing independent of that other thing? Or is it, or are they connected or not? Does it, you know, um, and so in the end, I kind of come away feeling like, okay, well, I now know that, pretty, you know, every model we tried, the optimal learning rate's basically the same. Every model we've tried, the optimal resize method's basically the same. And like, so I'm come away knowing that I don't have to try all these different things every time. And, and so now, next time I do another project, I can leverage my knowledge of what I've learned rather than do yet another huge hyperparameter sweep, if that makes sense. I see. You are the Bayesian optimization. <laughs> yeah, my brain is the, is the thing that's yeah. learning. Exactly. And I find like people at big companies that spend all their time doing these big you know, hyperparameter optimizations. Like, I always feel in talking to them that they don't seem to know much about the practice of deep learning. Like, they don't seem to know like what generally works and what generally doesn't work because they never bother trying to figure out the answers to those questions. But instead, they just chuck in a huge hyperparameter optimization thing into, you know, a thousand TPUs. Um, yeah, it's kind of something I've observed. That's that's really interesting. I mean, like, do you does it do you feel like these like 
hyperparameters generalize across different architectures, different models. Different oh, totally. Yeah, okay. totally. Um, in fact, yeah, that was a piece of analysis we did, gosh, I don't know, four or five years ago, along with the fellowship.ai folks and the platform.ai folks, we're just trying lots of different sets of hyperparameters across as different sets of data sets as possible. And the same sets of hyperparameters were the best or close enough to the best for everything we tried. Um, wow. That's very, a little That's bit kind of counter Yeah. And, yeah, and it is. It's, it's, with, with different uh, architectures, like I can somewhat imagine that, you know, data set maybe is not that super important, but, you know, between transformers and uh, CNS, I mean, I'm not uh, questioning this because yeah. I don't have any experience uh, to say that this is uh, not correct. I think this is wonderful and, and, and it surprising is. in a sense. It is. It's amazing. So, yeah, the fact that <clears throat> across 90 different models that we're testing that couldn't be more different. They all had basically the same best learning rate or close enough, you know. Um, so the, the, the very interesting aspect here is uh, tuning the learning rate is something that you dump a lot of time into. Usually when you start working on a project or in a Kaggle competition, you would uh, be naturally inclined to, hey, you know, I'm using a different architecture. Let me try to find the, you know, experiment with learning rates. But it's nice that you can uh, discuss, you know, focus on what really matters. Well, I should mention, Radek, um, this is true of computer vision, mm -hmm. um, but um, not necessarily for tabular, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Like all computer vision problems do look pretty similar, you know, um, the data for them looks pretty similar. Um, <laughs> I suspect it's also true, like specifically of object recognition. So like, um, yeah, for, I don't know. I, I mean, these are things like nobody seems to bother testing, like which I find a bit crazy, but we should do similar tests for segmentation and, you know, um, bounding boxes and so forth. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure yeah, we'd find a... the same thing. You have the learning rate finder, so we suggest maybe some different learning rates are, are good in different places. Well, the learning rate finder I built before I had done any of this research, right? Oh, okay. Um, like you might have noticed that I hardly ever use it nowadays in the course. Um, we, wow. I don't even know if we've mentioned it yet in this course. Maybe we have in the last lesson, I can't remember. Does anybody remember? Did we done the learning rate finder yet in course 22? Yeah, I think we did. You think we did? Yeah. Okay. Can I just add that uh, well, one of the really, you, know, you can sit there and play with parameters all you like and, and, and skid your wheels and, and get nowhere. Mm, and, um, right. And it's, it's, it's one of the things I'm really taking away from the course is the fact that you know, you're talking about strategy and uh, which goes back to, uh, Renato Copi in his 2002 paper, he had a term called strategy of analysis. And, uh, and that's something that really stuck with me. And so that sort of transcends that idea of just mucking around with parameters. Mm. Yep, exactly. And I suppose the uh, magic parameters, these are the defaults in fast AI. Um, yeah, pretty much. Although um, with learning rate, um, um, oh, that's weird. Um, with learning rate, um, the the default's a bit lower than the optimal, just because I didn't want to like push it. You know, I'd rather it always worked pretty well mm. rather than be pretty much the best, you know? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go and disconnect my other computer because it's connected to port 8888, which is gonna mess things up. I'll be back in one tick.
Actually, now I think about it, I don't quite know why this is connecting on port 8889. But part of this is to learn how to debug problems, right? So um, normally the uh, Jupyter server uses port 8888. And um, I've only got my SSH connected to forward port 8888, so it's currently not working. Um, so the fact that it's using a different port suggests it's already, it's already running somewhere. So the, to find out where it's running, you can use PS, which lists all the processes running on your computer. Um, and generally speaking, I find I get used to some standard set of options that I nearly always want, and then I forget what they mean. So I have no idea what W, A, U, or X means. I just know that there are a set of options that I always use. Um, so that basically lists all your um, processes, which obviously is a bit too many. So we want to now filter out the ones that contain Jupyter or Notebook. So pipe is how you do that in Linux. So that's going to send the output of this into the input of another program and a program that just prints out a list of matching lines is called grep. So we can grep for Jupyter. Okay, there it is. So I'm kind of wondering where that, how that's running. I wonder if we've got like multiple sessions of Tmux running. No, we don't. So Tmux LS lists all your Tmux sessions. Um, oh, I've got a stopped version in the background. Okay, that's why. So I just have to foreground it. There we go. That was a bit weird. Okay, so now that should work. How did you foreground? Sorry. FG. Okay. Control oh, Z to put it in the background, FG to put it in the foreground. And when you control Z somebody, it actually stops it, right? You can put it in the background and have it and have it keep running um, by, um, actually I'll show you. So if I press control Z and type jobs, that's stopped, right? So if I now try to refresh this window, it's gonna sit there waiting forever mm -hmm. and never gonna finish, okay? Because it's background, it's, back, it's, in the, it's stopped in the background. If you type BG, optionally followed by a job number, which would be number one, and it defaults to the last thing that you put that you put in the background, it will start running it in the background. Even and after you stop it. There. Yeah. So it's now running in the background. So if I now type jobs, it's now running. Right? Okay. And it's still attached to this console. So if I open up this, you'll see it's still printing out things, right? But um but I can also do other things. Um, and I don't do this very much because normally if I want something running at the same time, I would just chuck it in another Tmux pane. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know, it's kind of nice to know this exists. Um, something else to point out is once I said BG, it added this ampersand after the, the job. That's because if you run something with an ampersand at the end, um, it always runs it in the background. Uh, so if you want to like fire off six processes to run in parallel, just put an, amp an ampersand at the end of each one and it'll run It'll run in the background. I see. Um, so for example, um, here's a script that runs LS six times. And so if I, run it, you can see they're all interspersed with each other because it ran all six times at the same time. I see. And let's say like you create a process like this in the background without Tmux and you want to kill it. You use the PS you could, thing to you could you, thing. could F, you could type FG to foreground it and then, um, and then press control C. Um, yeah, something like that would would be fine, or you can you can kill a single job. Um, so in general, like you probably would want to search for bash job control to learn how to okay. do these things. Um, and as I said, one of the as it mentions here, one of the key things to know is that a job number has a percent at the start. So um, this is actually percent one would be how you okay. refer to this.
knowing what to Google is definitely yes. Knowing what to Google is the key thing. Although often you can just put in a few examples. So you could, like, I'm guessing, like if I take Control Z, B, G, F, G, jobs, which are the things we just learned about. There we go. Well, it kind of gets us pretty close. Now we know they're called job control commands. Mm. Um, all right. Now, um, So when I kind of iterate through notebooks, what I tend to do is like, once I've got something vaguely working, I generally duplicate it. And then I try to get something else vaguely working. And once that starts vaguely working, I then rename it to the thing that it, it, it is what I want. So then from time to time, then I just clean up the duplicated versions that I didn't end up using. And I can tell which they are because I haven't renamed them yet. And so this is kind you of how you can duplicate it. Like you, you make a copy. This looks like you're making copies of it. And yeah, running... so you can just click file, uh, make a copy. Yep. Or in here, you can click it and click duplicate. And so no, I mean, uh, do you like what do you do after you duplicate it? You try to. Clean and I'll it open up. up that. I'll open up that duplicate and I'll try something else, some different type of oh, parameter and different method or whatever. So in this case. Um, I started out here in Patty um, and kind of just experimented, right? And show batch and LR find and try to get something running. And then, you know, after that, I was like, okay, um, I've got something working. How do I make it better? And so I created um, Patty small, well, literally, I just made a copy, made a copy, and it would have been called Patty copy dot I find B. Um, and I was like, oh, I wonder about different architectures. Um, so I created this, like, I was like, okay, well, basically I want to try different item transforms, different batch transforms and different architectures. So I created train, which takes those three things. And so it creates a set of image loaders with those item transforms and those batch transforms. Use a fixed seed to get the same validation set each time. Train it with that architecture. Um, and then return the TTA error rate. And so then... Um, so this is kind of like your weights and biases. Like, this I guess is how so. you keep track of your different experiments, ideas, uh -huh. and yeah. these notebooks. So, um, yeah. So now you can see I've kind of gone through and tried a few different sets of item and batch transforms for this architecture. And this is like... So I, some just small architectures so they'll run reasonably quickly so these ran in about six minutes or so um and this is very handy right if you go sell all output toggle you can quickly get an overview of what you're doing um and so from that i kind of got a sense of which things seem to work pretty well for this one and then i um replicated that for a different architecture and found those things which you know these are very very different one's transformers based one's confident based you know find the things which work pretty well consistently across very different architectures and for those then try those on other ones swin v2 and swin um and yeah then find you know so then let's toggle the results back on um so I'm kind of looking at two things. The first is what's the error rate at the end of training? The other is what's the TTA error rate? So my squish worked pretty well for both. Crop worked pretty well for both. This is all for conf next. Um, this 640 by 480, 288 by 224 didn't work so well. I mean, it's not terrible, but it's definitely worse. And uh, 320 by 240 instead, uh, you know. Can you talk a little bit about what you're looking for in the TTA versus the I, final? I just want to see, like, I mean, the main thing I care about is TTA because that's what I'm going to end up using. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the main one. But, um, like, I just, let's see. In this case, this one's not really any better or worse than our best conf next. But the TTA is way better. So that, that's very encouraging, which is interesting. So this is now for VOT, right? 
Um, now VAT, we can't do the rectangular ones because VAT has a fixed input size. It has to, so the final transformation has to be 224 by 224. So if you pass an int instead of a tuple, it's going to create square final images. Um, and you know, uh, on the other hand, this one looks crappy, right? So definitely want to use Squish for VIT. Um, and then this one looked pretty good, you know. Um, so this was uh, using padding. So like for, for VIT, I probably wouldn't use crop. Um, then Last squid, time I looked, yeah. TTA was not really a thing in other modeling frameworks that is given to you. Is that still the no, case? No, as far as I know, that's true. Yeah. You know, so there are, I mean, a lot of people, well, one group in particular has been copying without credit everything they can from FastAI. They might have done it. Um, I won't mention their name, um, but yeah. Uh, so SWIN V2, apparently, uh, Tanish told me is what all the cool kids on Kaggle use nowadays. Um, that's a fixed resolution, and I found uh, the and um, for the for for the larger sizes there was no two two four. You had the choice of one nine two or two five six, and two five six it got so slow I couldn't bear it. But interestingly, even going down to one nine two, Swin's TTA is actually nearly as good as the best VIT. So that's I thought that was pretty encouraging. Um, the, this one, interestingly, like VAT, didn't do nearly as well for the crop. Um, and again, like VAT, it did pretty well on the pad. And then this is Swin V1, which does have a 224. Um, and so here, this TTA is OK, but the final result's not great. And so I, to me, I'm like, that's eh, not, not fantastic. This one's again, you know, it's interesting. The, the crop, none of them are going well, um, except for con next. Um, this one's uh, not great either, right? So, Swin V1, a little unimpressive. So, basically, that's what I did next. And then I was like, okay, let's pick the ones that look good. And I made a duplicate of Patty Small. Uh, and I just did a search and replace of small with large. So we've now got conv next large. And the other things I did differently was I got rid of the fixed random seed. So there's no seed equals 42 here. And so that means we're going to have a different training set each time. And so these are now not comparable, which is fine. You'll see if one of them's like totally crap, right? But they're not totally comparable. But the point is now, once I train each of these, they're training on a different architecture a different resizing method. Um, um, and I append to a list. So I start off with a empty list and I append the TTA predictions. Um, and so, uh, and I, I deleted the cells from the duplicate that weren't very good in Patty Small. Um, so you'll see there's no crop anymore. Just squish and pad for VIT and for swin V2. Probably shouldn't have kept both of the swin V1s, actually, they weren't so good. Um, and then what I did in the very last um, uh, Kaggle entry was I took the two um, the two VIT ones, because they were the, the, the clear best, and I um, appended them to the list so they were there twice. So it's just a slightly clunky way of doing a weighted average, if you like. Um, yeah, stack them all together, take the mean of their predictions, um, find the argmax across the mean of their predictions to get the, the predictions, and then submit in the same way as before. So that was, yeah, that was basically my process. It's like, it's very, like, yeah, not particularly thoughtful, you know, it's pretty me mechanical, which is what I like about it. Um, in fact, you could probably automate this whole thing. So somebody is about to say something. No, no, I was going to say how, uh, crit how critical is uh, like this model stacking in Kaggle? Like, do um, you, 
just curious how you think about that like i mean you know, it's like i i mean you can kind of i mean we should try right we should we should probably submit in fact let's well we're kind of out of time how about next time let's submit just the vit the best vit and we'll see how it goes um and that will give us yeah that will give us a sense of how much the ensembling matters we kind of know ahead of time it's not going to matter hugely uh i mean you specifically said on kaggle on kaggle it definitely matters because in kaggle you want to win um yeah but in real life my small conf next got 97 well rounded up that's 98 percent and my ensemble got 98.8 percent now that's in terms of error rate that's nearly halving the error so i guess that's actually pretty good really important question how do you keep track of what submissions are tied to which notebook Oh, I just put a description to remind me, but you know, a better approach would actually be to write the notebook name there, um, which is what I normally do. But in this case, I wasn't taking it particularly seriously, I guess. So I was only planning to do these ones and that was it. That's it. So it's basically like, okay, do one with a single small model, then do one with an ensemble of small models and then do one with an ensemble of big models. And then it was after I submitted that, that I thought, oh, I should probably weight the BITs a bit higher. So I ended up with the fourth one. So it's pretty easy for me. They only did four significant submissions. So easy to track. But yeah, I think um, now that I know actually that I'm doing a little bit more, because I actually did want to try one more thing. I think what I'll probably do is I'll go back and I'm going to, you can edit these. I'm going to go and I'll put in the notebook name, NH1. And then, um, and then I wouldn't go back and change those notebooks later, unless there was like, well, probably never. I would I would just duplicate them and make changes in the duplicate and rename them to something sensible. Um, and then of course this all ends up back in GitHub. Uh, so I will always see, yeah, see what's going on. So this is like MLOps Hamel without. <laughs> it's really interesting. No, it's like you have a you like every like quote run is a notebook. Like in right, the right. like, like the way to buy and kind of keep track. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean, the only reason I can kind of do this is because I had already done like lots of runs of models to find out which ones I can focus on, right? So I didn't have to try a hundred architectures. I mean, in a way, it, it forces you to really look at it closely. Yeah. Whereas if you just kind of like have this dashboard, right? You kind of like use a like at a this visceral. My view is that this approach, you will actually become a better deep learning practitioner. Um, and I also believe almost nobody does this approach. And I almost feel like there are very few people I come across who are actually good deep learning practitioners. Like not many people seem to know <laughs> what works and what doesn't. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, that's it, I think. Um, thanks for joining again. and. Uh, See you all next time. Bye. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. <laughs>